Um, regardless, often this is one of the last times that you know we have a chance to interact before you are out in the working world and you're uh, job seeking and getting jobs and coming back and contacting me as an employer, say you'd like to hire interns or your company is hiring people, and we love when you do that. So uh, you know, definitely keep in touch after um, you are finished. You know, here at Belmont. All of our resources and career services are a lifetime membership that you've got. You know your BUID number, hold on to that card, and you can access everything. You can always come in and meet with us, um, access our job boards, um, utilize contacts, join our LinkedIn groups, all kinds of um, stuff like that. So I encourage you to take advantage of those things. A couple weeks ago, it was a Sunday morning. I was running late for church as usual. Anybody relate to that? And uh, I go out and sit in my car and turn the key. Click, click, click. What's that mean? Any auto mechanics in here? Anybody know what that means when you turn the knob? Turn the ignition and keys clicking. It means you left something on and you're going to need a jump. Your battery's dead. I'm not even going to charge you for that piece of auto, uh, auto mechanic uh, 101 here. And I'm sorry, I'm actually, I'm not going to charge you for any of it. But uh, that means that your battery's dead and you need a jump. What happens when you get a jump? You take um, jumper cables, you hook it up to your car, you hook it up to a car that already has battery power, and you get just a little bit of energy from that car, put it on yours, and then eventually you'll get enough power to that battery that you'll be able to get off and running on your own. Now, you will have to disconnect the power of the jumper cables from your car in order to take off or you're not gonna get very far. Um, that is what I'm hoping to accomplish in the next hour here, is to give you a little bit of that uh, jump start, a little bit of that fire, um, something, give you something to think about that you maybe haven't thought about before relating to your job search so that you can disconnect the, the jumper cable from, you know, from us just enough to get uh, moving down the road toward that dream job. Speaking of dream job, though, I want you to um, think for a minute about how you're feeling um, about your career, about your job search. Hopefully not like this guy, banging his head against the wall and just feeling, you know, frustrated, overwhelmed. That is the way that some people tend to feel with it. Um, that's not the way you have to feel, though. Keep in mind, the job search is a process. You're not going to walk across the stage in May or in December or in August and have this dream job waiting for you. Sometimes you might, I hope you do, but that's not the case for most of us. For most of us, it's a process, and it takes one step at a time. We're going to talk about what uh, some of those steps are and to give you things that you can do starting when you leave here today and then that you can continue doing from now you know, up until you land that job, and really even after you've gotten that job, you know, continuously networking, continuously thinking about what your next step is. Has anybody seen the movie Christmas Vacation? I always got to throw a Chevy Chase reference in because he's just, just great. Um, only two people have seen it for real. <laughs> a few more. <laughs> well, this is like a classic, right? It's not yeah. the Christmas season until you see this movie. So that's your first assignment. Before you go out and look for a job, watch Christmas Vacation. Um, but uh, it was, it's an old, it's a late, late 1980s movie, but anyway. Um, Chevy Chase takes the uh, Griswold family out to find the Griswold family Christmas tree. And they're walking through this Christmas tree farm, trudging through knee-deep snow. Uh, I know none of you from Nashville know what that is, but if you're from the north, you may have may have seen that a time or two. Um, it's about knee high, they're trudging through, the daughter's frozen from her waist down, his wife says, don't worry, she'll see the tree later. Um, and they keep walking at tree after tree after tree, looking for just the perfect one. And then finally, they get halfway through the, the Christmas tree field, and there it is. There's a golden glow coming down over one tree, and Clark says, yes, that's it. That's the Griswold family Christmas tree. I give you that analogy to say that um, a lot of people will bypass a lot of other trees and they'll be looking for just the right glow coming down on that one job. Um, and that's not always you know, how it works. Hopefully you'll get to that, but it takes time. It's a process. Another example of this is uh, something that John Acuff 
said. Some of you may know who he is. He uh, is a local author and speaker down in Franklin. He came and spoke on campus uh, a year or so ago. And he gave the analogy of it being like um, a ski slope. When you're standing at the top of the, the ski slope, snow skiing, before you push off and go down the hill, um, you're not going to know every turn and every obstacle and every little spot that you're going to need to make a move before you get down the hill. You just can't see all the way down. Sometimes you got to get halfway down the hill before you can see what your next move is. And so sometimes we need to be willing to just push off and to just kind of start gliding and trust that we've prepared ourselves, we've done the research, we know ourselves, and that we're confident and equipped to handle whatever obstacles and things like that may may come our way. So that's just kind of an overview to put some things in um, perspective for you. As Kathy mentioned, uh, part of my job is to um, go out and talk with employers and develop relationships with them um, for, for you all. So there are job opportunities for you when um, when you graduate. I talk with them all the time. I get feedback from them and hear what kinds of things they're saying they want in recent graduates, what kinds of things um, they're saying that they don't want or don't like or wish they wouldn't do and that kind of thing. And, and I had a, um, a list of those things that I've, I've shared in, in past classes. And then about six months ago, I came across this um, little presentation. It's a little bit long. Um, it, might, it might run us uh, close to 10 minutes, but it was put together by somebody that does a lot of hiring for a PR and marketing firm. And I just think he hit the nail on the head in terms of things that employers were telling me. And so rather than me standing up here and going through a laundry list of thou's and thou shall not, uh, I figured I'd put on a little bit of, uh, put on some tunes, do some classical music so we're not distracted by the uh, lyrics. And we'll just watch this and it's called 11 reasons why I will not hire you. It's a little bit forward, it's a little bit smart alecky if, you, if that's even a word or if you'd call it that, um, but so take it, take it for what it's worth knowing that. It's, it makes it humorous though, entertaining, and it really does a good job of getting the point across. So watch it, think about things in it. If we have time at the end, which I hope we will, then uh, we can even talk specifically about some of the things that uh, that are mentioned. So let me cue up my random um, classical. Uh. So there you have it, straight from the from the horse's mouth, as they say, uh, straight from somebody that does this all the time, that is out there, that's making these hiring decisions. That's who, who uh, did it, PR and content uh, managing director, HP agency, <coughs> business, business marketing and communications firm, um, hbagency.com if you want to see more of that. So, five words then to be thinking about to jumpstart your job search. People, focus, marketing, plan, and action. I'm going to go through all these things. I'm going to spend a significant amount of time really talking about the top three because I think if you really understand how to apply the top three, you'll have a plan. And then um, action is unhooking the jumper cables and take it off on down Highway 65. So, first thing here is people. About two thirds of people who take a new position did not respond to an opening posted on the internet. According to Pew Center for Research, applying to jobs online is effective 4% of the time. Networking is effective 70% of the time. You get jobs by talking to people. I'm sure this is not something that is a new idea for you, something that you have not heard before. And guess what? Talking to computers doesn't count. Sure, you want to use computers. You want to use technology to your advantage as much as you can to get face-to-face -face with people. It's a whole lot easier to access these people through 
um, Twitter and hashtags and LinkedIn and Facebook and all of these sites, but you don't want that to take the place of a face-to-face -face meeting. You want that to be your avenue for setting up that face-to-face -face meeting. Now, that face-to-face -face meeting doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be some long, in-depth, two-hour, you know, conversation. 10, 15 minutes. Hi, I'm Chris. Here's what I do. Here's what I'm looking for. Um, what advice do you have for me in this? That kind of thing. Bring him a cup of coffee. Sometimes that's all it takes. Um, you want to think about those nearest you for who you may ask to meet with. Who are your friends? Who do your friends know? Who do your faculty members, your professors know? Who do your parents know? Your parents may not live in Nashville. It's a world of pretty connected place these days. Chances are they may know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who you know, has contacts here if this is where you're job searching or in Chicago or Philadelphia or wherever you may be looking um, to go after this. The goal is to get to the outer rings and the people that you don't know as quickly as possible. Everybody loves a student. What I mean by this is people like to help students. You're at a place now where you can, you can use that as an in, kind of you're taking in and say, I'm a student at Belmont, I'm graduating um, in May, I would really like to learn more about this. Yeah, come on in, I'll show you around, I'll introduce you to people, give you a tour, that kind of thing. If you're an employee at another company, competitor especially, hey, I'd like to learn more about your company. What do you want from us? Back up, you know? Um, you're a lot less threatening right now when you're a student and you're just looking to learn. So use that to your advantage. Um, email, LinkedIn, have some great ways um, that you can access people, find people. LinkedIn, none of these, these sites are not going to do the job for you. You're not going to sign up for a LinkedIn account and start having recruiters filling your inbox with job offers or with interview offers. You still have to do the work, but it helps you to get one step further down the road. It helps you to have an avenue through which you can find people and then begin reaching out and starting those conversations that begin online and then uh, take themselves offline. Some other ways um, that you can find people are through career fairs, through networking events. There's networking events all over this town. Um, you know, with just with you know the music industry and with all the startups and everything, and this being such a networking town, they're all over the place. You know, look on look on the internet. You know, you can just Google networking events. You can join professional organizations to help you find those. Like the there's the National Junior Chamber of Commerce. There are organizations for the specific area of study, like uh, the Society for Human Resource Management, American Marketing Association. Those experiences are going to get you uh, in contact and face-to-face -face with people that may be able to help you in your career down the road regardless of, of what you are looking for. Even if you're not looking for a job, if you're looking to start your own business, getting involved in something like that is going to help you develop the contacts to um, get to that place. A couple of years ago now, I think it was, um, for you country music fans, Brad Paisley won the CMA Entertainer of the Year for the first time, and he got up there and he said, um, he, he gave an old quote, um, but I don't remember who said it originally, so I'll say Brad Paisley. Um, if you see a turtle on a fence post, he had help getting there. And, I mean, you look at somebody like that, and he's saying, with all the success that he's had, I didn't get here by myself. Um, I got here with help, and, you know, you're all going to need help, too. And these people that are, you know, higher up in these organizations now, um, they had help at one point, too. There reaches an age and a point in somebody's career when they stop trying to climb the ladder. They say, I'm as high up as I want to be, or I'm as high up as I'm going to get. And then their purpose and their focus begins to be helping other people. Um, so take advantage of that. A little shameless plug here, because I got your, all of your attention, and because and I can. Although I know you all already have your tickets for the career fair. Uh, coming up next Tuesday down at the Williamson County Ag Expo building. Say that five times real fast. Um, but if you don't, we have some of those tickets here um, that you can grab. Uh, we'll pass that around. Make sure that if you do sign up on there that you are 
putting your name next to the actual ticket number that you've got because we're tracking um, who comes and who doesn't and things like that. So um, that's a great opportunity. We've got over 200 employers there. Pretty much all of our top employers, people that are hiring our graduates year after year, are going to be there. Um, it's during the day, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Over 200 employers signed up. It's an exclusive event. It's only open to schools that have um, worked together to plan it, to participate in it, and are putting money towards it. So you will need that ticket to get in. Um, highly encourage you. Um, again, even just as a networking opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, if you want to do some research beforehand and you want to see what companies are going to be there to see if it's going to be worth your time, or even better, you're planning to go and you want to, um, I don't know, maybe do some research on the companies that are going to be there that you're planning on talking to, nationalfairs.org. You can see a list of those um, to plan in advance. So basically, here's a formula for you, if that helps you think about um, how this works. Identify a job or something you'd like to explore. Find somebody doing it. Talk to them. Repeat until you're tired. Easy enough, right? Um, speaking of retirement, something I forgot to mention in the beginning of the um, segment was um, that the average person has 10.8 jobs between ages 18 and 42. That's not even your whole career. I don't know many retired 42 year olds, but that's 10.8 jobs. That breaks down to 2.2 years in a job and a new you know, position every 13 months or something like that. Um, that's just another piece of evidence that I think is interesting and also that lends itself to, it's about getting out there, finding something, getting experience, and taking the good and the bad from those experiences and applying it to the next thing. That also will help you to gain focus. Specificity is your friend whenever you are trying to obtain focus. Telling somebody, I am looking for a marketing support role with a consumer products company that uses social media skills is a whole lot more specific and it's a whole lot easier for somebody to help you than if you say, I don't know, I'd like to find something in marketing. The people that you are asking for you know, help and networking with, um, they're busy people. And they've got jobs and a lot of families and responsibilities and all these kinds of things on their own. They want to help you, but you need to be able to tell them how they can help you. Um, it's not their job to help you figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. That's your job. That's something I'm willing to help you with. Um, that's something that your faculty members here um, will often sit down and talk with you um, about. But professionals in these organizations and in these industries, um, they don't really have time for that. The more detail you can give them in saying, here's what I'm looking for, and you can tell them how they can help you, the easier that it's going to be for them to do that. Think of it like a dartboard. You go out and play darts on the weekends or in the evenings. Instead of picking up two darts, dartboard's over there, looking one direction, and then just kind of chucking them with both hands as many times as you can towards the dartboard and hoping, hoping I get somewhere close to the, uh, to the bullseye. Um, what do you do? You pick up one dart at a time. You look, you look at your target, you aim, you throw. You may not hit it. You got another dart, pick up another one, throw it again. Hopefully it'll get closer the second time around. Um, chances are, when you pick it up one at a time, concentrate on it, focus on it, you're going to get closer to this bullseye doing that than you are if you're just kind of aimlessly, you know, throwing them all over the place. Um, we're going talking to employers. This is important because they can get a sense for that. Um, that you don't really know, uh, and that you're just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. And that's not the kind of person that they want to hire. If they're going to make a hiring decision, they want to know that this, like they said in the video, this is where you've wanted to work your whole life. Your job is to convince them of that. You may not want to be there forever, but right now, 
this is where you want to be. This is where you want to start. And you need to convince them that they will not find anybody that's going to be better at that job than you are. Some ways that you can gain focus are, there's a number of things, one of them is through assessments. We've got a number of them on our career site. You can take those, it's called, it's called Focus. It's, it's free, just go to belmont.edu, backslash career services, click on it, take it. There's also one specifically for business majors called Career Leader. Send me an email if you are interested in that. I'll send you the username and access code and stuff for that. Um, and you can um, get some direction from that on Here's some career paths, here's some jobs that might be a good fit for you. Another thing is just looking at job postings. Just go on Career Connector, go on Career Shift, which is another awesome site, um, and there's information for uh, logging into all of these sites on this handout here. This is two-sided, basically uh, all, a lot of the different resources that we have available to you and will continue to have available to you even after graduation is on here. So. Um, Take a look at that. And just look at job descriptions. Um, pay attention to which ones look interesting to you. Which ones are you spending more time reading than others? There's some you're going to click on, you're going to go, ah, no, move on, I'm not interested. There's others you're really going to read. Find yourself spending some time looking at it, go ahead and print it off. Keep doing that. Set out a number of job descriptions out in front of you, and then go through them and start looking and say, okay. What do all of these different job descriptions have in common? What are the common themes here? Why am I drawn to these different things? You may be able to narrow your list down to a pretty short um, stack of, of things that you're looking for. That may be one way to, to do it. Um, informational interviews. That's one thing that I've been talking about a little bit and going and trying to get in front of somebody and talking to them and asking them questions. And I've got a handout to help you with that a little bit more too. It's this color here. Uh, it's going to be coming around in a minute. Um, it says informational interviews at the top on one side. And here are some sample questions that you can ask. For those of you that took Management 2000 through development workshop with me and bought that um, workbook and think, oh, I'm never going to use this again, uh, I actually copied these two pages right from that book. And so there's more stuff like this in there. I encourage you to continue to to use. Um, but the questions are such as, how did you get started in this business? What made you choose this company? What do you like most and least about this industry, this company? Those types of questions are going to be invaluable to you. Um, whether you interview with that company or whether you go to another job interview, um, employers are going to be impressed with some of the things that you know that you couldn't just find on the internet. Um, I will advise you in an interview, you don't want to ask any questions that you could have found the answers on there because that shows you didn't do your research. Uh, but but these are more personal insights and um, how does your company plan to deal with such and such? Wow, that's going to blow an, an interviewer's socks off. This person not only knows about my company and they know about my industry, but they know about some of the challenges I'm facing and they are thinking about how we're going to handle this. That's huge. You can gain some of these insights through informational interviews. So the idea here, pick one, two, three targets, go after them, pursue them, shoot for that bullseye. You exhaust those, then move on to something else. Now that's not to say that when you're on your way halfway down the ski slope, you're not going to find another path and maybe swoop over and take that one. That's okay. But at least you've got an end goal in mind that you're aiming for, rather than just kind of doing this, you know. You go down this way, take it, if that doesn't work, swing back around. Um, I'm not by any means saying put all your eggs in one basket, um, but I'm saying have it in. Um, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of the habits he talks about is begin with the end in mind. And so that's what I'm saying to do here. Be open to other paths and other opportunities as they present themselves. So then we'll talk about the third step in jumpstarting your job search, and that is marketing you. That's marketing yourself. The job search is a sales job in a lot of ways. 
You're finding out what the need is, what is the employer looking for, what are they trying to accomplish, and how can you, as a product, provide that for them. One way that you can do this is through the development of a marketing plan for yourself. I've made copies of a sample marketing plan. I want to hand out to you. And I know I'm giving you a ton of papers. Forgive me for all these trees that uh, I've killed in this presentation, but we will. I do recycle. So that, I'll pull it a little bit. Uh, but this is stuff I want you, I'm just kind of giving you an overview now, and I want you to go back and look at it. You know, spend some more time with it. So this, on the top, it says Joe Smith at the top. It looks like a resume. What it really is, is a, uh, a marketing plan. It is a place for you to sit down and say, okay, what am I really wanting to accomplish? What is that bullseye that I'm aiming towards? Um, it's a place for you to write down, what have I accomplished? What things do I want people to know about me? Um, and then what am I looking for? Who is my target market? What is my location that I'm looking at? What industry am I looking at? Healthcare, marketing, communication, service. What size of organization? Um, what type of culture am I looking for? Am I looking for some place that's going to be loyal to me? I want that security. I want to go there and I want to stay there. I want to spend a lot of my career there. I want to settle down. Do I want to go somewhere that's very entrepreneurial? Uh, it's maybe less stable, but I can be proud of a project that I helped start and I can talk about that down the road and I can learn what it takes to maybe start my own company. You know, one day, what types of things are you looking for? And then look for some companies in the area that you're looking that may exhibit that. Put those down on here. This is great because when you go in and talk to somebody, you don't want to force your resume um, too soon to somebody. Um, you want to build that relationship first. And this might be something that you give them in place of a resume. Ideally, you want them to ask you for your resume. You want them to be impressed enough by you that they say, I'd love to have your resume and pass it on to some people I know. Um, so until that point, what you have is this. This should be a working document. You're always adding to it as you're getting new experiences, internships, you're changing your mind about what you want, what you're looking for, and then you keep this thing up to date. You can provide it to um, potential um, you know, employers and, and networking contacts and, and people like that. Um, if you flip that over, it says writing your LinkedIn profile summary. This is some work that came from the author of the book, Job Searching with Social Media for Dummies, it's a guy named Joshua Waldman um, that has a company and a blog called careerenlightenment.com. Um, he has got he puts a new blog out every week. I read it every week. Lots of good stuff in there um, if you're interested in that. He came to campus last year um, and spoke as well. And this is some tips for writing your LinkedIn profile. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go through and revamp your LinkedIn profile in order to work for you or anything like that. Um, I'm saying that this is good information to have and things to think about just to know for yourself. As an elevator pitch of sorts, you've probably heard of that. You're on an elevator, you've got one minute to give a spiel to somebody about who you are and what you do. Here's a good formula to follow. You perhaps, I don't know, say you maybe go to a career fair sometime soon, like next Tuesday, February 11th, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., and you have something to um, tell them about who you are, how you help solve a problem, a statement that makes you the best. What have you accomplished? Here's why I'm better than the other people that you're going to talk to in this position. And what you are looking for. So um, there's some examples of that um, on that sheet here. Um, some lines for you to take some time to fill fill that out and you know brainstorm and mess with it a little bit just see see what works see what fits for you some other questions you may ask yourself I know I am in my element when how do you know when you're in your element you look at your watch and say it's three o'clock already or I cannot believe how fast time went I just don't have enough time for this but you know what? I'm pumped up. I'm full of energy. I'm wound up. I'm excited. I can keep going. Then you know you're in your element. Um, people recognize my expertise in, or other people comment on my ability to. I'm sure there are things that you have 
been doing since you were a little kid? And parents, of course, grandparents, because grandparents always think you're the best at everything, right? Your grandparents are, are telling you, you know, you're so good at this. And then that's continued to be a trend throughout your life, and you just take it for granted. Because you say, well, yeah, of course I'm good at that. Who's not? Everybody's good at that. That's easy. Um, it was not that long ago when I came to a realization uh, for some of those things for me that no, not everybody's good at these things. Uh, these are things that come naturally to me and um, they're areas of strength. If you want to use the strengths language and if you take the strengths assessment and things like that, um, they come naturally to me and um, they are really my opportunities to be excellent and to be successful and those are the things that I need to um, focus on. Pay attention to what those are. Look for opportunities as you're going through those job listings, those job posts on how you can apply those expertise um, in, your, in your job search and in your career. Another shameless plug, because it's cool and I think you should, uh, should make plans to attend if you're able. February 19th, in just a couple weeks, a Wednesday morning, 10 a.m., in Beeman A and B, not in this building, but in Beeman A and B, uh, personal professional growth convo offered. We're going to have a national um, speaker, author named Daryl Gurney. He's known as the Career Guy. You can check more more of his stuff on CareerGuy.com. Um, title of this book is Never Apply for a Job Again. Break the rules, cut the line, beat the rest. All about strategies and approaches and things that you can do. Um, in networking, to be known, to um, you know, develop a reputation for yourself, to be sought after by employers. Continuing with the marketing you, here are some examples. I'm not going to read through them out loud because you all can read yourselves. Um, but some examples of some ways that you might talk about who you are, what you can offer, uh, what makes you the best and what things you're looking for. Another handout I brought to Yellow Sheet. And it says your personal branding statement. This is another couple of pages from Joshua's book and on one page it says, I know I'm in my element when, or I have expertise in, all those things that I just talked about. If you flip it over, um, there's a little formula you can use. Anybody ever do Mad Libs when you're growing up, or maybe still? Um, write down a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb, a pronoun, whatever, and then you fill in the blanks. You can do that for marketing yourself. Come up with a verb, a noun, a value, something you can offer, and then an outcome. I do what for whom who want to blank so they can whatever. I've talked a little bit about my job and what I do with you, so I thought I'm gonna sit down and try this for myself and see see what I might write. Here's an example of, of what I might say. I what I research job search strategies and opportunities for students and recent graduates who want to, what do they want to accomplish? They want to pursue full-time employment after graduation so they can, what, have access to the best information and opportunities available to assist them in achieving their goal. If you come up with something like this, you can say this is who I am, this is what I can offer. You don't have to have a job description or a job title in order to do this. It's not easy stuff, I know, and especially when you haven't had a job before, you're in school and everything like that, but you want to have, again, a goal in mind, you want to have a target, and so this is what you need to be thinking about as you're doing internships, as you're working in different places. What am I doing? What am I good at? What, uh, what are my performance evaluations saying? What are employers saying to me in terms of things you know, that, that I'm doing well, and how can I communicate those things to other people. So then number four, a couple of the um, ones that I'm going to go through a little bit quicker are the plan and the action. 
the plan, the samples what I already gave you. It said Joe Smith at the top. It helps you to be in control. It helps you, instead of saying, I don't know, I'm at your mercy, find me a job, to say, here's who I am, here's what I can provide, and here's, um, here's what I want. And this should always be a working document. This is something you want to continue to be adding to and changing as you get more experiences and you say, I want to do this, I don't want to do this, I thought I liked this, don't like this as much as I thought, um, and keep working on this document. That's going to be the same for your resume, especially in the first couple of years out of school. Um, and when I say couple, I mean several. I hope you don't have a ton of jobs in the first um, two years. But while your career is young and you're moving around a little bit more, you want to keep your resume up to date um, so that when a job opportunity comes along, it's there and it's ready and you don't have to go through and figure out what you accomplished and what you did in a job five, six, seven years ago. Um, that kind of thing. And then five, take action. Use online job leads, have a target list of people that you want to reach out to, people you want to contact, um, follow up with them. I'll talk about some ways to network and follow up here in a few minutes. And then we're back to where we started. Some other techniques for taking action is uh, the FIRE method, one you could use. Find companies and people you want to target. That's the first step. What are you looking for? If you don't know what you're looking for, just start looking and figure out what it is that you want, and then find companies that offer that kind of a thing. Um, identify companies and individual needs. Again, that's where the sales part comes in. What are these companies looking for? What is it they need? How can you provide that? Reach out to potential information sources. Gather information. Talk to people. Um, get that inside scoop, that inside information that I was talking about earlier. And then the interesting thing is the last part is engage with the decision maker. That's the part that we often do first. And just forget the rest. I mean, the resume, the cover letter submission, that's here. Not always going to happen. This is, this is an ideal scenario. And what you want to be thinking about um, is having done all these things. Because then you know how to and where to look to engage the decision maker. Um, you know what the company's needs are that you can put in your cover letter and you can tailor your resume to. You can reach out to potential information sources and um, tell them, hey, I've got a resume I'm submitting you know, for this position, as opposed to submitting the resume and then saying, okay, um, who do I know that I can tell you know, that I've applied for the job? That's okay, too. Um, this is, a, um, this is a good way to go about it if you're able to do that. Again, not an easy thing to do, but it's good to have a goal and idea in mind. So, ditch your resume. You want to prepare a great resume, but you only want to provide it when asked. Sometimes resumes can get you routed to HR, a black hole for job seekers trying to network. Um, this is like just going around and handing out resumes to front desks and they say, yeah, we'll keep it on file. How many times have you heard about somebody getting a job from a resume that's on file? Hey, Chris, yeah, um, we got your resume two years ago and we kept it on file and we're wondering if you want to come work for us now. <laughs> I've never heard of that happening. Have any of you? You know, if, if they're going to look for a job, they are going to be um, putting new job postings out and wanting, you know, the most recent um, people and knowing people that are you know very interested in their company and are following up and coming to them rather than them finding people and trying to um, to seek them out. Trying to give somebody a resume before you know you develop the relationship before they ask for it in a networking setting is like um, taking someone out and asking them to marry you on a first date. The pro response you're going to get is probably like, "Whoa, slow down, take a step back, let's get to know each other a little bit first exaggeration, but the same kind of thing with this. Um, you want to be asking for information, ideas, leads, referrals. You want to be asking about the field as a whole, which organizations might be growing, uh, which areas of the country might be better than others, and so on. There's particular company or particular cities that you may want to move to for particular industries. If you um, are wanting to work in you know, healthcare, Nashville, you know, would be some place that you would look to come because this is a big healthcare um, 
city. And he talked with professionals in different um, organizations and different industries. They'll sometimes know, well, our headquarters is here or there or, or that kind of thing. And so you could look in those places as well. The goal is to become the inside candidate. There is a job search author, speaker, consultant named Don Asher. He's very well known. He coined the term uh, the hidden job market. And this is basically the jobs that you can't see. The idea behind this idea is if I have the option of flipping through hundreds of difficult to distinguish resumes that look the same and I don't know any of them or have any connection to them and trying to hire somebody that way as opposed to um, finding a resume through somebody that works with me already, somebody that's a friend and can vouch for them and say, uh, I know this person, I at least have seen this person, I know, um, you know a little bit about them. You say, I'm gonna go this route of the familiarity every time. The reason for that is because Hiring is a high risk, high liability game for employers. Turnover is costly. You make the wrong hiring decision, that's a lot of money down the drain that you spent recruiting this person, that you spent training this person, and the productivity that you're losing while this position is open and you're trying to hire and train somebody else to take that position. So you want to come off as the safe candidate. You don't want to be looked at as as a risk or uh, you know, as a challenge or anything like that. You want to make the employer feel as comfortable about you and your desire to be there and um, your loyalty to them and everything like that that you can as much as possible. This also means talking with everyone who will listen. Use all channels, know what you're looking for, um, even strangers standing in line to, uh, you know, to buy coffee behind you at Bongo Java or somebody, you know, that you're waiting around sitting next to at the airport or wherever. Um, this doesn't mean having business cards printed out and be, you know, throwing them out everywhere you go, hey, call me, call me, I, I, you know, do this, whatever. What it means, knowing who you are, knowing what you're looking for, and if the conversation presents itself, you know, being able to clearly um, and articulately that articulately, I can't even articulate that on myself. Um, but you know, explain that and be able to tell them um, who you are and um, what you're looking for. Asher tells a story of another woman who flew into Indianapolis to interview for a job with a big company there. She was sitting in the cab, and instead of sitting in the back seat of the cab texting or taking pictures of the skyline as she was driving down the interstate or you know, posting them on Instagram or something like that, um, she engaged in conversation with the cab driver. She said, um, so I'm here in town to interview with uh, such and such company. What do you know about them? Gathered some information from him. Got some insiders, some locals perspective, you know. Good interview, interview material. Um, Especially if you're in the interview and you tell the employer, well, I was talking to the cab driver or whoever about such and such a company on the way here. They're going to be like, man, she wants this job. She's, that's impressive. Um, so that, that's one thing. But anyway, she was engaging with the cab driver and the cab driver said, you know, that's a good company. Um, but I've heard a lot of good things about this one over here. And I think this one you know, might even be a, a better company for that particular thing. She calls up the other company and says, um, I'm in town interviewing for a position with you know, company A. I've got a little bit of time uh, to meet. I'd be interested in stopping by and just introducing myself, saying hello. And uh, this was an opportunity for company B to get a little bit of insight and see what are we up against? What kind of people are they bringing in to interview? Of course you're worth our time. You know, she goes on in. One thing leads to another. She gets, ends up getting a job offer from both of the companies. It all started with just a, you know, an innocent, small talk conversation with a cab driver in Indianapolis. So um, those things can, can happen. It's all about asking. Who do you know? 
who know anything about blank. There's another um, story about a, um, a guy who was going to visit his aunt Nadine in a retirement community in Florida. He's probably thinking, nobody in a retirement community is going to be able to help me get what I want, which is a casting director job out in California. Um, it comes up in conversation one day. He goes ahead and mentions it, you know, to his aunt that he's staying with. Turns out one of her neighbors in that neighborhood has a relative or a friend who lives in Statesboro, Georgia, that used to be a um, casting person out in LA. She made a call, was able to make that connection, is able to get some interviews out of it, and um, you know, that all happened as a result of hanging out, talking to Aunt Nadine. So uh, the idea here is you just never know what a conversation um, like this is going to lead to. You don't ever want to rule any possibilities out. Keith Ferrazzi, New York best-selling author that wrote a book called Never Eat Alone. Um, anybody heard of it? It's good stuff, it really is. Um, he's got another book out too, he came to campus, uh, it's been about a year or so ago now too. Um, and I, pulled, I read through Never Eat Alone, I've read it a couple times, pulled out some of the uh, main points from that that I want to go through briefly with you just to get you thinking as you're doing some of these things that I've been talking about here. He says give more than you get. He says every time you meet somebody for the first time, that is an opportunity for you to introduce yourself, to ask them questions, and to discover what is it are that they're looking for. And how can I help them to get it? How can I help them to accomplish that? That's really what you're what you're doing when you're talking to people and asking questions about their um, lives and, and things like that. Um, and you want it to be more about what you can do for them rather than what they can do for you. What they can do for you will come, uh, but you want to think about how I can help somebody else. The next thing is. Build it before you need it. One of the worst mistakes you can make in networking is to meet somebody. You never really talk to them again, never really reach out, and then, oh, when you need something, there you are. I hope none of you have friends like that. You only ever hear from them if they need something. You almost know when you see that number or you see that name come up on your phone. What do they want now? Maybe it's not friends, maybe it's family. You know, how that can go. Um, you don't want to be that person when it comes to professional relationships and it comes to networking. You want to um, constantly be kind of at the forefront of their mind, keeping in touch. Um, there may be some a number of ways you can do this. You may get involved with projects with them through the company or through extracurricular, you know, organizations and things like that. Um, you can get involved in local, you know, clubs or organizations, or even just do painting, which, uh, which I'll talk about at the at the end here, um, but that's just a way of sending articles and keeping in touch once in a while. Hey, I was thinking about you just a real quick kind of a hope you're doing well kind of a, a, a message. Um, the next thing he says is, is don't smooth. He says when you go to a networking event, um, don't make it a numbers game necessarily and just try to meet as many people as you can and hand out as many cards as you can and be that person that's not really making connection with anybody because you're too busy just trying to get your card in people's hands. Nobody's really going to remember you from that. They might remember you as that person, but they're not going to feel as though they made a connection. They're not going to feel any commitment or any desire to really help you down the road if you come back around and are looking for that kind of a thing. He says, take a little bit more time, talk to a few people, you know, less, and really make a connection. Learn something about them. Learn that they're a Vanderbilt football fan. And then, you know, congratulate them, you know, on a big win against Alabama or something, you know, something like that. Um, and so the next thing after that, never eat alone. This talks about doing the things that you're already doing, just inviting people to join you in that. Hey, I'm going to, 
you know, eat a meal or grab coffee or, you know, go on to check out this new exhibit at the Frist or I don't know, whatever it is, um, and say, you know, would you like to come along? It doesn't have to be a big, elaborate, you know, planned um, meeting. It's just about continuing to extend invitations and, and, and you know, keep yourself out there in, in a sense. Follow up. He says if you're going to go to the trouble of meeting people, you're not going to um, follow up and maintain the relationship, then you really have not done yourself any uh, benefit of going out and meeting them in the first place. He says you should follow up the first time after meeting somebody within 12 or 24 hours. That may just be a quick, hey, you know, great meeting you. Uh, let me know if, um, if I can help you out. It's a LinkedIn connection. It's uh, an email, uh, a text message, something like that. And then connecting with connectors. This talks about people that just generally know a lot of people. You all know who these kinds of people are. People that own restaurants, bartenders, PR people, politicians, fundraisers. Um, it's part of their job to just meet and sit and talk with people. Um, be intentional about connecting and you know maintaining a good relationship with those people. You want to make sure you have a good relationship because if they don't think highly of you or like you or something like that, that relationship is not going to be all that beneficial um, for you. He says, he says, bring something to the conversation. This has been called conversational currency. It's the idea of doing your homework um, beforehand. Um, if you're going to meet with somebody, you know what they're into, um, <coughs> read up on it a little bit. Sit, you know, sit while you're waiting for them, pull up Wikipedia on your phone, and just get a general idea. Dale Carnegie in the book How to Win Friends and Influence People talks about a guy that was going to meet with somebody else that was very much into ships, just different kinds of ships and makes and models and things like that, and he knew enough about them to continue to ask questions that continued on the conversation. And at the end of the conversation, the guy was like, man, you sure know a lot about this stuff. And you know, the person was like, actually, I know very little. I just read up enough real quickly to do, he didn't tell him this, but this was in the story, um, enough to ask questions to keep you talking about it <coughs> you know, and to keep you engaged. Next thing you know, that guy really felt a connection with him because he did a little bit of research beforehand. Uh, Larry King from Larry King Live Show said, there are two questions that you can always ask the people in order to keep them talking. Let me tell you something. One of them is why. Tell me why you did that. What was the reason behind that? And the other one's how. Tell me how you did that. Give me more information you know, about that. So those are some ways that you can continue to um, you know, bring something to the conversation. And then pinging, uh, the last one, that was the thing I mentioned. Just um, quick, casual ways of becoming planted in and at the forefront of somebody's mind. Hey, I saw this article that you might um, enjoy. Take a look at it. Um, I don't know if any, I did this this week, I don't know if anybody saw the map of Nashville floating around Facebook. I thought that was hilarious. Is this the What's that? The judgmental map? Yes, yeah. the judgmental map. Mm -hmm. I said that to my realtor. Um, just because I thought that's something that a realtor would enjoy. Now he can't post it, and I didn't post it to Facebook because it's not all politically correct and some things are exaggerations, but it was fun and it's entertaining. And you know, I could tell by the way that he responded to that email that he enjoyed you know, looking at it. He told me he thought about posting it, his secretary advised him against it, you know, and all that <laughs> stuff. Um, but that just kind of kept, keeps a good relationship between the two of us. When I see something like that, I think of him and say, thought you'd enjoy this. And so, as you're seeing things, um, LinkedIn is great for always having like articles that I recommend recommended for you. You know, at the top of it when you log in, if you if people come to mind when you're reading it, that's a great way to um, to ping um, two to three times a year to maintain at least some kind of secondary relationship is what what he says that you should do um, in order to uh, to maintain that. So, lots of information coming in, uh, coming to the checkered flag here. Uh, your goals for this month. Start conversations, not necessarily interviews. Interact with class. Be, do your research, 
don't waste somebody's time by not go, by going in and talking to them and not knowing what, what they do and about them a little bit. Um, show that you value them. Follow up with them. Um, be incredibly curious. Learn all that you possibly can. Read whatever you can get your hands on. Um, just be genuinely interested in other people. Just ask questions. It's amazing the things that you can can learn, you know, in a waiting room or, you know, on a plane. Don't be that person on a plane. You know what I'm talking about. The person that won't shut up in the seat next to you. But, you know, um, if they look like they're willing to have a conversation, you know, continue to, you know, engage in that and get to know people. Um, you never know where those might go. Uh, get real. Um, face the reality of the experience that you have that you probably don't have a lot right now and what you know and what you don't know. Half the battle is knowing what you don't know and being willing to admit that. And that is about um, not necessarily um, promoting yourself as a budding CEO when you're trying to get a job as an assistant product manager, um, but sharing what you do and being willing to, um, you know, to um, admit what you, what you don't. And then finally, setting your expectations right. Knowing that, yeah, right out of school, um, six weeks of vacation and working from home on Fridays and wearing jeans every day and a paid trip to Maui every summer or every winter even better, that's all nice. Um, and those may be perks that people that are higher up in those organizations that you're going for get. Um, but that may not be what you get right off the bat. And to go in and to start asking for all of these things may not leave the best impression. We all are millennials. Um, there's a lot of good things about millennials. There are also some stereotypes. I'm sure you've probably heard about what you know, some of those are about um, um, you know, having everything catered towards millennials and thinking we're better and we know more about the internet and about technology and, and all this stuff. Um, just be, and, and being entitled is another big one. Um, thinking that the world or at least a company owes us something. Now, I'm not saying that any of, um, anybody in this room is like that, but that stereotype exists about millennials for a reason, and it's important to know that that is sometimes how you could be perceived by an employer, particularly a baby boomer or somebody that um, has been at an organization a long time and has had to work very hard for many years to get where they're at now. And then they have somebody coming in a lot younger than them with all this experience demanding those same types of perks. As you can imagine, they, that may not sit well. Um, baby boomers um, value FaceTime. They have the come early, stay late kind of a mentality. And um, so that's something to think about as you are entering into the working world and wanting to make the best impression that you can, can make. So this was kind of a flyover of information. Hopefully, um, if we haven't gotten um, your battery completely charged, there's at least some sparks. We're getting there. We're getting closer to giving you something to be thinking about that you hadn't thought about before, that you can take and apply as you move forward um, in your job search. We have about five minutes, and I want to show you something in LinkedIn that you may not be aware of, but I also want to see if anybody has any questions. So I'm going to um, turn this on and log this, log in here. But in the meantime, are there any questions about anything that I've said that um, you're wondering about or like clarifications or anything like that? I mean, yeah. For this career fair, uh, like as I've been getting ready for it, I guess the biggest question I've like kind of started to think about is like, what would you, what would you recommend the appropriate amount of resumes to bring? You know, I know you can plan it and like, you yeah, know, plan it like that. But aside from that, I'm sure you know there's going to be those companies that you just run into. I think it's a good idea to um, go on the National Fair site yeah. and look and see um, what all companies are going to be there, and that'll give you a realistic idea um, of 
how many you think you will need. I think you're better to have too many than not enough, you know, for sure. And so um, there's going to be 200 companies there. You probably can't talk to, um, you know, but a handful of them. What are you seeing up there? So what? So remove Kimball used in shoe rubber <laughs> I eat a lot of stuff. I won't charge you for that knowledge either. That's free. That's good. That's good conversational currency, huh? So, did that answer? Yeah. Did that answer yeah. your question? I mean, just think about how many you can realistically talk to. Depends on how long you're going to be there, too. If you're going to be there for five hours, you may want a lot more than if you're going to be there for, you know, three. I would encourage you to, um, if you bring hard copies of your resume, which you should, to print um, them on resume paper. A little higher duty, uh, you can get at Walmart, office supply stores, that kind of thing. Um, just a little bit nicer, a little bit fancier. Other questions? Okay, so how many people have LinkedIn accounts? Awesome. How many are aware of this? You go to networks, you go to find alums. Anybody know how to do this already? Cool. You go to find alums. It, Belmont will come up here for you. That's my alma mater, so that's what comes up. Let me type in Belmont. There it is. Attended from 1900 to 2021. Uh, those 1900 graduates that are on LinkedIn. Um, and you can search for Belmont alums anywhere in the country for the most part. You can see where they work, what they're doing. Let's look for Belmont alums in Chicago. We'll click that. You can see where they are working at. Uh, you can see how many of them are there. Uh, let's click on this second city. See what they're doing. Okay, they're working in sales. Who is that? Um, there's two of them there. And those are both second degree connections for me. That means I know somebody that knows them. I can click shared contacts. Who's that? Okay, Allison Daniels. She worked for me here um, at Belmont as a student a few years ago. And um, who's that? <laughs> I don't know who that is, <laughs> but uh, you can see that's why you should only have people you know. Um, you know, you can look and see who these shared contacts are. Here's this is somebody that works at Belmont. I feel like every time I have a second degree connection, David Fish is the common denominator. You also get to know him. He's the director of Young Alumni Programming. If you don't know him, he'll probably be reaching out to you after you graduate too. So you'll get to know.